Welcome to this lab on the conservation of energy and momentum. And so activity two deals with this ballistic pendulum, but activity one deals with the energy of a dropped ball, which we'll examine using a motion sensor. And so if you can imagine a position versus time graph, sort of a height versus time graph of a dropped ball, it would look sort of like this. It starts at some height, and as it falls, it gets faster and faster, and you've got this parabolic um, shape here, determined by the um, our kinematic equations, showing the position of the ball over time. So imagine our time axis going this way. Well, if we were to plot the potential energy of the ball, to look at the change in potential energy, it would look just like this. It would have the same shape because potential energy is mgh, where m and g are constants. And so this would just be, it would just look just like h versus time, or position versus time, scaled by a factor of mg. So here's our potential energy. Now as the ball begins to fall, it picks up speed. So it starts off with a low velocity, and our velocity versus time will be a linear graph with increasing velocity. And so, but however, we want to plot our kinetic energy. And kinetic energy goes with velocity squared. It's one half mv squared. And so, probably not surprisingly, because there's no non-conservative forces at work except for a small amount of air resistance, the change in kinetic energy is going to look just like the opposite of the change in potential energy. Very much like this. And so our total mechanical energy, which is the sum of these two, is going to be a horizontal line showing no change. Actually, let me show a slight change, a slight downhill to this line. It will be, there will be a small change in the mechanical energy. It's going to decrease a little bit. And that's because of the non-conservative force of air resistance as the ball falls through the air. But now something happens that I want to look at when the ball hits the ground. Something very strange. You see, as the ball hits the ground, well, we have a change in potential. Let me add to that a change in kinetic, delta Ke. And that is equal to our sum of those two, which is a change, delta Me, change in mechanical energy. Now, as the ball hits the ground, it's going to come to a stop, bounce, and it's going to go through some bounce that looks sort of like this. Then it's going to bounce again. Now, you've noticed how I've drawn this. The ball doesn't bounce as high on the second time as, it, as you dropped it from. And on the third bounce, it doesn't go as high as the second bounce. So somewhere along the way, we're losing energy just by observing that the ball does not bounce as high. Now, where does that mostly happen? Well, you see, you see that in the air, the ball is not losing a lot of energy because its mechanical energy stays about the same. Um, kinetic energy. Because you see this ball comes to a stop, that means its kinetic energy goes to zero. So it had reached some maximum right before you hit the ground, and very quickly the kinetic energy drops to zero. But then as the ball bounces back up, the kinetic energy again pops up to some maximum value, but we'll notice that the maximum value is not as high as it was before. And then it makes the shape sort of like this. So as the ball's height gets higher and higher, the kinetic energy drops, and to this point, the ball is at the top of its path, and it stops again, and goes back down. Kinetic energy goes to zero, then back up. Again, the ball hits the ground, and then pops back into the air, and our cycle complete, completes. Our cycle repeats. So, how does our mechanical energy look during this time? Well, our mechanical energy, because potential and kinetic are zero, it also goes to zero. gets back and becomes the sum of the two, goes to zero at the next bounce, and comes back and it's the sum of the of two. So what I want to do is look at what's going on in between here during the bounces. And as it turns out, there's a third energy in there as well. 
And this is the spring energy of the elastic ball. As the ball hits the ground, it compresses. And so its kinetic energy that it had here is converted very quickly into spring energy, all right, elastic energy. And so as it does that, this is not something we're observing through watching the motion of the ball. But our mechanical energy is not really going to zero. However, it is decreasing. And so we get this step down in, connect, in mechanical energy that's due to the fact that energy is lost during this interaction with the ball on the ground. So as the ball strikes the ground, the energy um, is lost due to the um, sound, due to the friction between the ball and the ground. And the same thing happens over here on the second bounce. Energy decreases. So our mechanical energy really is doing this sort of a step down. And the reason it looks like it goes to zero because kinetic and potential are going to zero is because we're not taking into consideration the elastic potential energy of that bouncing ball. To watch the height of a drop ball, uh, convert that to potential energy, gravitational potential. And then, you know, with a motion sensor, you can also not only get the height, but the velocity. So you can also, from that, figure out the uh, kinetic energy, plot those against each other, sum them up, and you should be able to get a third plot called total mechanical energy, and you can sort of observe whether it follows that step-down pattern. Um, this is how we'll do it. Here's your motion sensor. Here is the elastic ball. And probably the easiest way is to just set the motion sensor over the edge of the table and hold the ball underneath it. It needs to be at least 15 centimeters from the motion sensor because there's a certain amount of time that it takes the sound to bounce back and it has to be far enough away that the sound doesn't bounce back before the motion sensor converts itself from a, from a speaker to a microphone to receive that signal. That happens a little past the 15 centimeter mark. So starting 15 centimeters below the sensor, we can now drop this ball and observe the bouncing motions. So, as you saw from the dropping ball, each bounce was lower than the bounce before it. So obviously we're getting some kind of decrease in the total mechanical energy due to that collision between the ball and the ground. So during that collision, energy is lost and we'll examine it using Logger Pro. We've noticed that mechanical energy, the change in mechanical energy is equal to a change in potential plus a change in kinetic. And of course, we also now have this third term plus a change in um, elastic potential energy, we'll call that EPE. Those three things sum up to the change in mechanical energy. If the change in mechanical energy is not zero, then we know that that's due to the fact that there was work done by a non-conservative force. So a change in mechanical energy is equal to the work done by a non-conservative force. Our next activity deals with a simple pendulum. Now the simple pendulum is a pendulum here, and it is great for looking at three different things. Conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, and good old-fashioned projectile motion. And so um, the way this works, I have a ball here. Now this ball is, uh, has a mass. Let's call it mass M. Okay. So we'll say mass M. That's going to be a given. Now, in order to get the ball rolling, so to speak, we will put it on the end of this rod. And I'm going to do some work here. So the amount of work I'm going to do is, I'm going to do that by compressing a spring. Now when you compress a spring, let's talk about what happens. Um, Hooke's law says that the force on a spring is equal to K times X, where K is the spring constant, which indicates the stiffness of the spring, okay, it's how, and then X is the distance that you compress it. And so if I'm going to hold a spring compressed at a distance X from its equilibrium point, it takes a certain force, F, to maintain that compression. So that's the force here. Now as I compress a spring, as you can see as x increases, the force increases. So it's a nonlinear force. So therefore, I start out with a very smaller zero force at first, but as I 
go all the way into x, my final displacement, I have a force F. And so my average force, because this is a linear relationship, my average force is half of F. So going from 0 to F, my average force is 1 half F. And so, um, so, uh, so as it turns out here, my average force is 1 half Kx. Now if I'm going to do work on this spring, the work is equal to my average force times the distance of displacement, x. And so uh, we know that average force is 1 half kx. So 1 half kx times x is 1 half kx squared. 1 half kx squared indicates the amount of energy that I've given to the spring. This is potential energy, stored energy of the spring. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to compress this with, a, with <coughs> an average force. It got harder the further I pushed in. And now it's locked. The spring has been compressed. How much is it being compressed? Well, I can measure that compression with the, um, with the plastic ruler. And I can see it's changed from its equilibrium point. The difference between its new position and the old position is, the, is x, the amount of compression. I don't know what k, the spring constant, is. All right, well, let's talk about energy a little bit. Now, when I release this, uh, pull this trigger, the spring is going to decompress. That spring energy, this, the potential energy of the spring is going to go from 1 half kx squared to 0 because it's no longer, no longer compressed. Well, that's going, that energy is going to be transferred into a change in velocity of the ball. And so along this same line, this flat line, this ball is going to pick up energy. Now right now the ball has no energy. Let's say, well, let's talk about the potential energy of the ball. Well, let's define where the ball is to be the zero, to be zero height. So I can say because of this, um, where I've chosen zero in height to be, this ball has no potential energy, no potential gravitational energy. And so right now it's not moving, it has no kinetic energy. And so when it starts moving though, the spring is going to push the ball forward and all that energy in the spring is going to be converted because there's very very few or not many non-conservative forces at work so let's just say if they're inconsequential all this energy is going to be converted into the kinetic energy of the ball so that 1 half kx squared that's equal to 1 half m v squared where m is the mass of the ball which is given to you. Now as this ball travels across through here, it's going to be dropping in height a little bit, so it'll actually be gaining a negative potential energy, so to speak. But let's, uh, let's say it's moving fast enough that it's really not dropping at all between the end of this, um, between when it starts off the end of the spring and when it collides with this little cup. So we're not looking at a very big loss in kinetic in, in, in height. So let's say its potential energy is still zero, it's not changing. And our kinetic energy, the ball is not really slowing down, so it has that same kinetic energy when it hits the cup. But when it strikes the cup and it lodges here in the cup, that's a collision. And we know that energy from one side of the collision to the other is not conserved. We verified this in the laboratory situation. So I'm going to put a not equal right here. This is not equal to, and so here's the collision. This is the initial energy. And we're going to say the initial energy is not equal to the final energy of the ball. Because in a collision here, energy is not conserved. And so now the energy is, once it hits the cup, let's say this cup has a mass of big M. That's the mass of the cup and the rod. Okay? And it has a mass of big M. And so our new energy after this ball strikes is going to slow down, of course because energy is lost and our new energy is the kinetic energy of the ball and the cup together. So that's little m plus big M times v squared, but then we'll call this v2. And back over here we'll call this v1. Um, so it has a new velocity v2 and it begins to move in that direction. So that's the new energy. Now something else is going to happen. <coughs> You see I've got the little needle here? As this rotates, the needle moves. And what this does is it's measuring the angle of rotation. 
And so let's say it gets up to this height and then stops and begins to swing and oscillate. Well, this needle measures theta. So theta is something we can determine. We can determine this angle here. And so let me sort of um, talk about why we might need theta. Let me pull this out of the way a little bit. As this pendulum, here's the pendulum in the cup, because that's big M. When the ball strikes it, you see the ball goes into the cup, then it swings through this angle. Theta. So if we know what theta is, what we can do is this. We also know what the length of the pendulum might be, the length L. And L is something that's given to you or that you can measure. It's from the pivot point to the center of mass of the pendulum. You don't know really where the center of mass is, so we're just going to give you the value of L. And so if you know what L is, you can determine this side. L is the hypotenuse. Here's theta. You can determine the adjacent side of your triangle. And then the difference between L and the adjacent side of the triangle is this value, H. The height that this ball and pendulum combination has risen. It's risen a certain height off, the, off of the original point. And so at that point, it stops moving. It comes to a stop and goes back the other way. Now, when it comes to a stop, all the kinetic energy of the ball and the cup has gone to zero. And that means that all of that energy that was kinetic, it's now potential because it's raised a certain height. So that's all that kinetic energy, that's actually at the top of the swing becomes equal to mgh. And the mass, of course, is a little m plus big M times g times h. And h is something we, we determine by knowing theta and l. We determine h. And so you've got this long string of stuff dealing with energy. Well, we can, uh, we can do a lot, but we're stymied here by this um, inequality. So let's say I knew what the height was now in G, and I knew what these masses were. And I can go back and say, I want to know what the spring constant is. I want to figure out K. Well, I can say, let's work our way backwards. And so I'll go down here, and I'll, get it, and I'll say, this, this is equal to this. All right, well, I'm setting this equal to that. I notice that I know a little m, the big M, I know, the, I know g, gravity, I know h, the height. I don't know velocity squared, but I can solve for this using algebra. And so I can tell you how fast this was moving after the collision. However, because of this inequality, I can't tell you anything that happened before the collision yet. Now, in order to make a bridge across the collision, we have to use the idea of conservation of momentum. Because we know that the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum in a collision. So this is going to help us out. Now the final momentum in the collision, because we now know this V2 from our previous calculation, I, you can tell me what the final momentum is. It's equal to mass times velocity, and where our mass is little m plus big M times V2. So this is the final momentum after the collision. Right after the collision, this is the momentum of the cup and the ball. And so before the collision, the only thing that was moving was the ball. The cup was stationary, but the ball was moving. It was going right here with a little m, mass, and a certain v, v1. And so before the collision, the total momentum of the system was little m times v1. And so what we've done, we, we can now go to here, to here, to here, and then bridge the collision. And now we know what V1 is with a little bit of algebra. If M, big M, and v, V2 is known, we can solve for V1. Knowing V1, let's put it back up here into the kinetic energy just before the collision. One half little m, V1 squared. Now we know what the energy was before the collision. It's greater than after the collision. And we use momentum to bridge it. And so now we can go back and knowing this, we can, knowing what x is, 
our displacement of the spring, we can determine k, the spring constant, right? And also, what was our average force when we compressed the spring? We can calculate that. Now, one thing you might want to do is determine the range of a projectile. And so if, if, I wanted to, um, if I wanted to figure out how far this ball might go if it didn't hit the cup, let's say if the cup were out of the way and I just fired it straight across onto the floor, how far would it go? Well, what I need to know is the initial velocity of the ball. And it's a horizontal velocity. And so by knowing theta, by determining theta, knowing L, Knowing big M, little m, I can calculate here, to here, to here, to here. And once I get here, look, there's V1, the, the velocity of the ball before the collision. So if there were no collision, now I know V1, the horizontal velocity, and using projectile motion, there's something else I need to know, and that's the height of the ball off the floor. Now I can use the um, kinematic equations, or the range equations, that we have to, um, to determine how long it takes to hit the ground and by that how far out it will go. So I, I want to figure out where the ball will land. And so I can make that calculation using kinematics and, um, and make my prediction of where the ball will land. I can set a piece of paper there, put my line, and see how close the ball strikes to that line which is my prediction of the range of this fire projectile, little m. So a lot of things you can do with the ballistic pendulum and I hope you just come up here and have a little fun with it.